Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to uh, Houston. Uh, for those of you from out of town, welcome to the Mises Institute's high school seminar on profits. Are profits evil? We're going to be asking and answering today and having a lot of these. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, we have the answer already. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what profits are, uh, what functions profits serve, um, and the differences between profits in a purely free society and profits in an interventionist society like the one we have in the United States and around the world. Um, I want to give a special welcome to our friends and supporters who are watching us online. This event is being uh, streamed live on the Mises Institute's television channel on Mises TV. Um, we're glad to have all of you with us as well. Um, you should all have a program uh, listing today's uh, schedule. Uh, we have um, two outstanding speakers lined up for you, or at least one outstanding speaker, uh, Dr. Robert Murphy, who many of you know through his writings and through his uh, videos and, and other appearances. Um, uh, Dr. Murphy received his PhD from New York University, where he studied with some of the uh, most eminent scholars in the Austrian economics tradition, such as Israel Kirzner, Joseph Salerno, Mario Rizzo, and others. Um, I'll also be speaking uh, uh, today. I'm Peter Klein, uh, Executive Director and Carl Menger Fellow with the Mises Institute and also a professor at the University of Missouri. Um, the high school seminar today, as well as our Mises Circle tomorrow, uh, are made possible through the very generous support of the late Jeremy S. Davis and his wife Helen. Uh, from here in Houston, some of you had the pleasure of meeting the Davises and uh, the world lost a great uh, champion of liberty uh, when Jerry Davis passed away uh, last year. Uh, Jerry was a member of the Mises Institute's Rothbard Society. Uh, he was a graduate of Williams College in 1956, majoring in philosophy. Uh, he received an MBA in finance from Columbia University in 1960. He worked in the real estate, uh, energy, investment, uh, and, and other businesses. Uh, he was very interested in Wall Street uh, in the energy industry, not surprising for someone here in Houston, also in art and in higher education. Uh, he was particularly uh, enthusiastic about the Mises Institute's student programs, high school events such as this one, and also our Mises University for college students. Um, uh, Mr. Davis was the first uh, donor to sponsor a high school seminar like the one that we're having here today back in 2009. Uh, he also brought uh, another group of high school students here to Houston uh, starting last year in 2011. And of course, uh, his generosity is allowing us to have this event and also our Mises Circle with uh, Ron Paul and others uh, tomorrow. So we very much appreciate uh, the support of Mr. Davis and other uh, uh, generous benefactors of the Mises Institute. So profits. Um, what are profits? Why are profits important? Uh, should we care about profits? Uh, should we be concerned about profits? Right? You know, we gave the, the seminar the title, Are Profits Evil? Now, those of you who are attending uh, this event today and those of you watching online are not a random sample of the general population. And uh, most of you probably are uh, more sympathetic to the idea that individuals in a free market ought to be able to earn the profits that they can earn and that it might actually be a good thing in terms of channeling resources towards entrepreneurs and other individuals who are in a position to use them effectively. Uh, that that in, Folks like that should earn profits, that they strive to earn profits to avoid losses and that this is part of a healthy and functioning market system. However, as you know, uh, if you watch television, if you ever go to the movies, if you've ever turned on CNN, you know that in our culture today, in popular culture, among members of the mainstream media and politicians, profit is a dirty word. It's often a dirty word, right? Um, if you look at the typical Hollywood blockbuster movie, the villain in a movie like that is most likely to be a businessman. Right, whose aim is not to you know, take over the world uh, uh, or destroy it with nuclear weapons, but to earn a heck of a lot of money. We want profits, and that's typically the way we depict someone in popular culture as being a bad guy. Right? All he cares about is profit. Uh, protesters tell us to put people before profits. 
or when the news media wishes to uh, you know, demonize or begin the process of demonizing a particular entrepreneur or a particular business, the lead will typically begin by reporting that company X earned record profits last year, right? Huge profits are being earned by this company or that industry or this individual. That is, and we're conditioned to, to bristle at that. Oh, oh no, someone has earned huge profits. What have they done wrong, right? What widows and orphans have they thrown out in the street? This kind of thing. Um, now, of course, those of you who have studied economics, particularly economics in the Austrian tradition, know that that's not, not the right way to think about profits. However, right, it's one thing to talk about what profits do and what function profits serve, where profits come from in a, in a market society, in a free market economy. But the picture gets a little bit more complicated when you live in an interventionist society with a so-called mixed economy like we have today, right? With a healthy dose of market activity, but a large measure of government intervention. In a society such as that, we might tend to be a little bit more skeptical even ourselves, right? In that kind of a setting, some entrepreneurs some business people, some companies can in fact earn profits not by producing the goods and services that consumers will freely choose in a market setting, but because of government patronage, because of special protection that is provided by government officials, and a whole host of other means that we'll talk about today. So what we want to present to you this morning is what we consider to be a very balanced perspective, right? What are profits? What are losses? What function do they serve in a free society? How is that picture made more complicated in an interventionist society? And what can we do uh, to make things work better? So that's what we want to cover in the three uh, uh, um, talks that we have scheduled for today. And please note that there's also a Q&A panel uh, at the end of the, uh, of the event today. That's an unstructured panel where you in the audience can ask any questions uh, that you like. Uh, we particularly welcome questions from our student attendees, and we may tolerate a question from a parent or two, but we certainly want to favor the students uh, in that discussion. And uh, we do, do have a, a coffee break, a bathroom break at 11 o'clock uh, for 15 minutes. And uh, again, if you need anything uh, during the day, please see me or please see Christy Holmes in the back. So without further ado, let me turn it over to Dr. Bob Murphy. Thanks, Peter. Uh, thanks, everybody. I hate following him because I have to adjust the mic down all the time. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, Peter and I were discussing right before we started here the, the difference because he's a college professor and I, and I was one for a few years before I had to get out. Uh, just the difference between giving a talk to a bunch of high school students and, and their parents versus college kids that, for one thing, you were all here early. You all sat down quietly. People are actually sitting in the front rows. You know, these are things that will never happen when you guys go to college, just to, to warn you. Uh, another difference I noticed when he first came in here and said, good morning, you guys actually said good morning back to him. That's just inconceivable uh, that that would happen at college. Uh, they, they, they would just look at you like that. So uh, we do appreciate you guys coming out. Just to echo some of the things that Peter said here, uh, just keep in mind, there's a mixed group here. Some of you... Uh, this is the first time you may have come to an event like this. Perhaps your parents dragged you here and you're wondering why you're here. And so we can't just assume that we're all on the same page. And so in these sort of introductory remarks, these opening lectures, Peter and I are going to give you the, the foundation. Uh, and then in the Q&A, of course, that's the, the place where I know some of you are much more advanced readers in this tradition. and You can ask us the real hard questions. Uh, before we started here, I was talking to a 16-year-old young man and I'm... Uh, uh, he was asking questions I'm not sure I would know how to answer, right? So he, for sure he's smarter than Peter Klein, and he might, he might even be smarter than me. We're not sure yet. We're going to see. Um, but anyway, he'll, he'll stump us in the q and I'm sure. So as, as Peter said, this, uh, this is a, a hot-button issue, and of course popular culture teaches us, whether in the media or uh, movies and, or press, that if somebody's earning a profit, that's prima facie a signal that we should be suspicious about this person, that they're doing something underhanded. And that's the sort of knee-jerk reaction that we're going to try to diffuse today. So as Peter joked, you know, one, one quick way is just to say, are profits evil? Nope. Let's go to the restaurant, right? We could be done. 
But we want to push it farther than that. We want to explain why is it that we don't think it's right to just say is a knee-jerk reaction, profits aren't evil. But on the other hand, we don't want to commit the opposite mistake. We don't want to come off as saying that somebody who earns profits, you know, you don't need to give me any more information, that person is morally praiseworthy, and we should all try to be more like this person. Or when you're raising your, your children, you know, we're not saying you should teach them that the real important thing for how you should live your life is go be profitable, you know, in terms of uh, dollars and cents. That's not what we're saying either. So I was trying to think of an analogy to get that across, and the best one I could come up with would be a sports analogy where, uh, you know, if, if we grew up in a, in, a, in a culture where everybody thought that winning at sports was a bad thing, and that, you know, if, if newscasters said, you know, so-and-so scored 40 points in last night's basketball game, and we're looking into that to see how that was possible, you know, and, and they were really scolding them, you know, that would be an odd thing, because I think most people would say that in general, being successful at sports, you know, being the high scorer, being the MVP, those are good things. Certainly, you wouldn't say they're evil. Now, by having said that, does that mean, therefore, that winning is everything? That if we catch somebody who wins because it turns out he was cheating, that that's still a good thing? Well, no, of course not. Or even something less obvious, if somebody, you know, a coach, for example, is the winningest coach in, in his sport, and he's being lauded officially, you know, going to these meetings and so forth, but yet in his private life, he's a scoundrel, that he comes home and yells at his kids or whatever, and he doesn't care about them because all he cares about is that his team is successful on the court or on the field, well, then most of us would probably think, well, that's not a good thing either, that he's placing, you know, being successful at sports above things that should be more important. So it's a similar thing, I think, when it comes to profits. Uh, certainly, uh, Peter and I, I believe would be on the same page with this, that what we're saying today is there is a sense in which, without giving us more information, earning profit per se is actually prima facie a good thing. And if you have the sort of standard morality that most of us possess, then you would say it, it, it's, a, it's a good thing, a morally praiseworthy thing. But that doesn't mean everybody who earns profits, therefore, is a good person and we should emulate them. There are ways you can earn profits that are not morally praiseworthy. Okay? The last little caveat is, you know, why would you possibly put two economists in front of a crowd to talk about what morality is? That's a very unwise strategy, right? Because I believe me, I know a lot of economists and, and their views on what's right and wrong a lot of times are, are pretty horrifying. So why, of course, we're here is because the reason the public has this knee-jerk objection to profits and most people are suspicious when they hear about, oh, somebody's profitable, the reason isn't so much that we have a difference in terms of our morality, really. It's not that really what the difference is for most people is that they don't understand what it is that profits actually do. And so we think if we educated people, which we are qualified to do as economists, to say what is the function of profits in a market economy, then we think everybody's shared moral framework would kick in and they would realize, oh, okay, I didn't realize that when you earn a profit, it's because of these, these considerations and now that I understand just the, the, the neutral mechanics of it, you know, not being judgmental one way or the other, just studying it as a scientist, as it were, and understanding what do these things do in reality, now our moral framework kicks in and we can say, okay, so now I'm not going to have this knee-jerk suspicion. So the, the first thing we should do really is explain what do we mean by profits. Now in, in today's talks, we're going to be at a sort of casual level, we're not going to get too... Um, too technical. So I think one useful way to think about it is just to say, if you buy something at a certain price and then sell it later at a higher price, well, then you've earned a profit on it, okay? And, that, and that's really, I think, what most people have in mind when they talk about earning profits. And so it's that action, as simple as that is that I just described, that we're gonna say there's a very real sense in which that someone who goes out and does that, that buys something at one price, and is able to later sell it at a higher price, that per se is a socially useful thing. And in the absence of other information, we should say, yeah, we, that's a good thing. Go ahead and, and do more of that. Good job. Well done. Now, if you want to get a little bit more technical, people distinguish between profit and interest. So let me just spend one moment talking about that difference. You, you see the distinction there. Uh, you could, if you lend someone $1,000 and, and then you write a formal contract and say, next year you're gonna give me back $1,100, right? So the rate of interest would be 10% on that loan. Well, technically that fits the definition where you, you give somebody you know, $1,000 and then 
time passes and they give you back more money than what you put into it originally. Some people, you know, is that profit or not? Most economists would say, well, no, that, that's interest. All right, so what people, what economists usually have in mind when they talk about profit is earning more on something than the, was generally expected. Okay, and that really isolates what it is that entrepreneurs do or speculators do when they seize profits, when they're able to buy something at one price and sell it later for a higher price, it's because they saw the future better than the average person did. And that's why that was possible. All right, so let me just give you a silly example to, so you see the distinction there. It would be, you know, imagine somebody says to you, oh my gosh, I have this foolproof way of making a bunch of money. What we should do is in early July, let's buy a bunch of stock and fireworks companies. Because I've studied the statistics and just without fail, every year, right around July 3rd, the sales of fireworks just go through the roof. And so let's be smart and get in early. Like we might even get in in mid-June just to be safe and we'll buy a bunch of stock of fireworks companies and then you know, we'll wait until the stock price goes up and then we'll sell you know, July 5th or July 6th. And, that, and that's my plan. All right, now, that would be silly, right? But so let's think of why is that a silly plan? Because everybody knows that on July 4th, there's a lot of fireworks that get purchased or right around that time. And so that information has already been priced into the share price of any companies that have to do with manufacturing or selling fireworks, right? So you, you wouldn't be able to earn a profit based off of that insight because that's something everybody knows. The way you earn a profit in a market economy is you see the future correctly and it can't be something obvious. It's not that you're gonna you know, invest in uh, winter hats as we go into winter. I mean, people know there's gonna be a surge in sales of those things. What you have to do is see the future correctly and in a way that's not obvious. And that's what gives you the opportunity to jump in because what happens is, and we'll talk more about this uh, later on, what happens is the prices right now don't reflect that future bit of information that you have that other people don't have, right? So it's your superior ability to forecast the future that gives you that edge and allows you to earn profits. And of course, if you're wrong, well then you will suffer losses and that's the flip side and I'll be talking about that more in my second lecture. Okay, so but, but that, that is the, the essence of it and that's the sense in which, and we're just gonna elaborate on that basic insight, that's the sense in which earning a profit is morally praiseworthy to the extent that we want to encourage people to go out and forecast the future better, and we'll see that that adjusts our, scarce, uh, our use of scarce resources so that we take into account the future more correctly, right? We, when people, let me just put it this way, we have to do something with resources. And by we, I just mean collectively, of course, in the real world, it's specific individuals have to make decisions, but we, human beings, when they go out, they have to make decisions about how are we gonna use our resources. There's only so much copper and tin and crude oil. There's only so many workers with various types of skills to go around. It's been, decisions have to be made in some way as to how are we gonna use those resources and what sorts of things are we gonna start producing for the future. And so, of course, what's gonna guide us in that? Well, one of the things is we have to anticipate what are people gonna want in the future? What are the consumers gonna want? And so what it is that profit does, it's a signal that somebody forecasted better about what the consumers were gonna want down the road than his or her peers did. And that's what made the profit opportunity possible. Because again, it's not enough just to say something obvious that, you know, I think people are gonna want apples next month. I bet you some people somewhere in the country are gonna wanna buy at least one apple. Everybody knows that. You can't earn a profit off of that. What you could earn a profit off of is to think, right now, most people in the market, in the Apple industry, the, the retailers and the farmers and so on, think that the demand for apples is gonna be a certain level, but I think it's gonna be higher than that. And I'm willing to put some money on that proposition, and so I will invest my resources banking on the fact that I think there's gonna be a demand for more apples than everybody else right now thinks. And so if that person ends up being right, then we'll see that that actually helps people, that they're gonna be glad, the people who wanna get more apples next month, those people are gonna be glad that there was somebody a month earlier who, who saw that coming and then did things that were perhaps in his narrow self-interest to do, but yet yielded this beneficial outcome 
uh, that, that helps them as well. So there I've touched on what I'm sure many of you have heard of is what's called the invisible hand. And that, it's a metaphor that goes back to Adam Smith. And it, the idea is that in a market economy, the, the genius of a market economy is the incentives are such that people who are doing things that just directly benefit themselves, and that, and that could be why they're doing it, nonetheless, again, assuming that it, it is a genuine market economy and we have property rights that are respected, that will shower benefits on the public at large. And so the, that's what Smith was saying, that it's as, as if by an invisible hand, people acting in their own immediate interest promote the general welfare. I'm paraphrasing, but, but that was the gist of what he was saying. Okay, so, that, so that's a sort of a, a beautiful outcome, that it, it takes you know, people's sort of innate selfishness and greed and channels it into something productive so that the person who's lying awake all night in a market economy trying to think, I, I really want to be rich, how do I do it? Well, the way you do that in a market economy is you have to sit there and think, how do I best satisfy my customers? Or if you're a, just a financial speculator, you got to think, what are prices going to be like in the future that other people aren't seeing right now, and how can I be better than other people in anticipating those things? All right, and so that's, that's pretty benign, right? That that's what a market economy does. It takes these really ambitious people, and it makes them lie awake at night thinking about how can I make other people happier? How can I do that? And, and that's what a market economy ends up doing when you understand uh, economics, especially in the, in the Austrian tradition. So... How is this possible? How could it be that when people go out and earn a profit, that that showers benefits on everybody else? Well, the, what lies at the heart of that is that a, a, a voluntary trade is a win-win situation. So what do I mean by that is there's this uh, false idea I think, I think a lot of people have when they say that if somebody earns a profit, it must be at the expense of somebody else. Right, that one person's profit must correspond to somebody else's loss, in which case profits would be a zero-sum game. But, it, but to, to repeat, that's not the way the world is right now. Right? In a market economy, if somebody goes out and earns a profit, that doesn't imply, oh, there must be somebody else who lost the same amount. And so it's just a big wash. And so the only way you can win is if somebody else loses. That's not the way genuine free market capitalism works. So to, to see the essence of that, we don't have to get real fancy with, with complicated examples. We can just think about something real simple, like two kids go to school and they have their lunch, and the one kid has a peanut butter sandwich, the other kid has a bologna sandwich, and the kid who has peanut butter, you know, his, his parents have sent him to, that, with, to school with that thing for a week straight, and the same thing with the kid with the bologna sandwich. He's been getting that a week straight, and they're sick of it, and they would each prefer the sandwich that the other kid has, and so they, just, they swap at lunch. And you know, something as simple as that, just analyzing that as an economist, you say, okay, w what just happened there? Talk about that. Well, they both walk away from that exchange thinking they're better off, right? Because the kid who started out with the peanut butter sandwich, we're saying just suppose he wanted, he would prefer to have a bologna to a Peter sandwich, so he makes the swap. So in his mind, he got the better end of that exchange. He gave up something less valuable and got something more valuable. And on the flip side, for the other kid, it's the same thing. He started out with a bologna sandwich. He said, I would much prefer a peanut butter sandwich. So in his mind, I got rid of the thing that wasn't valuable or as valuable and walked away with the thing that was more valuable. So that's sort of interesting if you think about it. How can it be that they both walked away with the more valuable item? And it's because value is in the eye of the beholder when we're talking about economic value in this context. Right? It, it wouldn't be possible, just to make sure you understand what I'm saying here, it wouldn't be possible for both kids to walk away from that trade with the heavier sandwich or the sandwich that had more calories or the sandwich that you know, had more fat content. Right? That wouldn't be possible because that's an objective property of the sandwiches. One of them is heavier, or they could be exactly the same, and one of them has more calories and one of them has a higher fat content. So it can't be that they both walk away with the heavier sandwich because that's a physical thing intrinsic to the sandwiches. But since to say what's the better sandwich, meaning in terms of how the student feels about it, well, that is in the mind of, the, of each student. And so it is possible that they have different rankings because again, what we, it's, economists would say value is subjective. 
It's not an objective property of the sandwiches. So that simple insight really sheds a lot of light on how it is in a market that profits serve people because the essence of what somebody does who earns a profit is he buys something that is valued at a certain amount by people and he transforms it in some way and then produces something that people value more highly. And that doesn't, it's not that by doing so, he must be sucking that value from somewhere else, right? It's, you can increase people's valuations and that's, and that sense, that sort of metaphorical sense or loose sense without it draining from somewhere else. Just like those two kids when they approached each other and made the swap of the sandwiches and walked away. And if you, you ask the one kid, hey, did you get the better end of that deal? And he says, yep. It doesn't follow that, oh, that other poor other kid must have gotten ripped off. No, they both could have walked away truthfully thinking that I got the better end of the deal. And it's not that one of them was swindled. They both really did benefit. And so that's the essence of how it is in a market economy. If somebody perceives something and realizes the crowd is missing this, that you know, we, they're going to want more apples next month, or these resources right now are being used to make these products over here, but you know what? That's, that's not the best way to do it. I could take those same resources and I could make something that the consumers would want even more. And by doing that, and then you earn a profit in the process, you're not therefore uh, hurting somebody else necessarily. Okay, so that's, that's really the, the essence of, of what we're talking about, and, and that's how it's possible. Let me spend a few moments talking about a very important contribution. So as you can see here, we're from the Mises Institute. I'm sure most of you know who this gentleman was, but in case you don't, uh, Ludwig von Mises was one of, in my opinion, one of the, the most important economists, certainly of the 20th century, perhaps even of all time. He made many contributions, and one of his most important was his critique of socialism. So for our purposes today, we're, I'm not going to get too technical with it, but I do want to just give you the broad outlines of, of what it is that he pointed out, and you'll see the relevance to our discussion about uh, the social usefulness of, of profit. So what Mises, what he's going to say is, is that socialism as a, as a system doesn't work in terms of allocating resources, all right, that it's just, it's just not efficient. And to understand the importance of his contribution, you should see he was taking part in this debate when, uh, certainly in the late 1800s and early 1900s, when a lot of intellectuals thought that socialism was the wave of the future. So they thought that rather than having prices and profit and loss and having individual business people be the ones in charge of directing resources in their limited spheres of influence, surely we can have a much more rational, sensible, moral economic system if we take a bunch of experts and then take a bunch of people who we all agree are, are very wise and, and morally upstanding people and, and form a committee and then have them advise the government or maybe even the people in the government themselves are the ones making these decisions, but in some sense, we'll, we'll be more rational and scientific about it. And we'll just look at what society needs, we'll look at what's physically possible in terms of our technology and supplies and so forth, and we'll have the, the government centrally plan what things are produced. And surely we can improve upon whatever the market does. Because at the very least, the government could just mimic whatever the market's doing right now. Right? And so that was one of the, they thought a trump card in their argument. We can just do what the market does right now anyway. So surely, if we don't like, if we can all agree, certain outcomes in the market are morally objectionable. Like, why should there be people starving when there's people over here who have, you know, a bunch of fancy horse-drawn carriages and so forth? That doesn't, we can, most of us can agree that's a, that's a silly outcome. So if we can just tinker and improve on the outcomes of the market that way, surely socialism is going to be better and we can eliminate all the waste from advertising and, and silly things like that, that that cutthroat competition forces us to endure if we had this more rational scientific approach to economic production. All right, so that was the scientific socialist agenda. That was their, their blueprint for a better society. So there were lots of objections that, with the, that the classical liberals brought up, the economists, uh, you know, in the tradition of Adam Smith and so forth, and then there's a French tradition as well, 
of people who we would nowadays consider to be free market or laissez-faire economists, there was a lot of uh, ob objections that they brought up. And one of them was to say, just look, you, you can't trust these people. You know, if you gave, if you gave a, a handful of people that much power that they could literally control the economy, they could do some really terrible things with it. And just, you know, people uh, can't be trusted with that much power. And so that's the virtue of a market economy is it decentralizes it. So no group of people can ruin everything for the rest of us. So that, that was one type of objection. And it's a, it's a veil objection. So it's pretty important to know that if you study history, you can see what a veil objection that is. Another objection people brought up is they said, wait a minute, if, if, if we're gonna have the central group and if we literally applied the, the Marxist slogan of, you know, from each according to his ability to each according to his needs, well then, wouldn't that mess up the incentives for people to produce, right? If, if, you, if you as a worker know that I'm not gonna get my share of the total output, you know, the amount of uh, food that I get and the kind of house I get to live in and the car I get to drive and so on, if that's not directly tied to what somebody's willing to pay me for my production in the marketplace, the way it is under capitalism, well then what incentive do I have to really exert myself? Why wouldn't I just slack off? All right, and so a good analogy for that kind of argument is to say like in a class, if the teacher didn't tailor everyone's grade to how each student did on the test, but instead just gave everyone the same average score after there was an exam, would students study as much going into the exam? Probably not, right? They, because they would just realize, well, my score is gonna get diluted among what everybody else does, and so the incentive to study, so they, the class average would itself drop in that sort of framework. And so that's what a lot of these classical liberals brought up is a problem with socialism, was to say that incentive's gonna be totally sapped. Well, you know, why would people go and, who's gonna wanna go work in the coal mines if they're not getting paid more because of that? You know, why wouldn't everyone wanna do the real easy jobs? All right, so that was another big objection. And so the socialists came back and they gave their responses and they said things like, well, it's true that in a market economy, growing up in this dog-eat-dog -dog world of cutthroat competition that we've all been conditioned to, to be real, stingy with our money and just be real, you know, it's all about me, me, me. That's just, that's not na natural to people per se. Socialists said that's just a conditioning because we grew up in this awful capitalist world. If you were born into a socialist world, then you wouldn't have those tendencies. People would be happy to go and, and work for the general good. They'd be happy to, to do whatever the, uh, you know, central planning board told them, we think in the interests of the country, this is what you ought to be doing right now with your labor time, all right? So that was kind of, you know, you, so some people were real cynical and the socialists were real optimistic and that's kind of where the debate was at, was at a standstill, basically arguing over you know, the nature of man and that's kind of a hard question to resolve. So it was in this context that Mises came in then and he brought up a completely novel argument and he said, look, for the just for the purposes of, of argument, sake of argument here, let's stipulate that the central planners are all perfectly trustworthy, right? We don't need to worry about some hidden sociopath seizing power, some tyrant, and then doing nefarious things. Let's assume the people in charge just want to act in the, in the best interest of the nation and that they're going to do what they honestly believe is the right thing in order to use our resources effectively and, and promote the general welfare. And let's further assume, just for the sake of argument, that all the workers dutifully do exactly what they're told and that there's no shirking, that it's not that somebody shows up to work and, and just you know, screws around or whatever with his buddies because he knows, you know, I'm, I can't get fired. We're all com socialist comrades here. They, what are they going to do to me? That let, let's assume that people don't think like that, that they're all just happy. They wake up in the morning. What are my orders, sir? And they run and go do it, knowing that what they get to consume isn't directly tied to, to their individual contributions. He said, let's just assume that. Still, Mises said, there's this fundamental problem and the socialists do not understand what it is that profits do in a market economy. Mises said that the problem here is that the socialist planners would have no feedback mechanism. They would have no way of knowing, even after the fact, if their plan made any rational sense. So they could have all the technical details. They could know if you take resources and combine them in these certain combinations and, and amounts, you can get this amount of output. You know, so the, given our resources, given uh, the skills of our workers and so on, the, the central planners could know 
that, oh, we can, uh, we can produce this many cars, or we could produce this many apples, or we could produce this many uh, diapers for newborns, or we could produce this many houses of a certain size. They could have all this, these individual facts of engineering and technology, but what they wouldn't have is they wouldn't know what should we produce with our resources. They would know all the possibilities, but they wouldn't be able to say this combination of output is better or worse than this other physically possible combination of output. And it, that is the fundamental thing that, that profits and losses do for us. It at least gives us some type of feedback. So I'm, I'll talk about this more uh, in the second talk I give to you guys in, in a little bit. But just to anticipate it, what Mises was saying is that in a market economy, if somebody is doing the wrong thing, the, the signal, the way you get feedback about that is you start suffering losses. Because what's happening is, you know, what does it mean to suffer a loss? It's that the resources you're using, you had to pay a certain amount for them, and now you're producing things that the consumers are only giving you less money for, right? So you're not able to, to cover your costs, and so you're suffering a loss. So Mises' point is, that's not just some arbitrary number that accountants come up with. That corresponds to something real about the real world to say you're suffering a loss. Or the flip side, if you're earning a profit, that corresponds to something real about the world at large. It's not just some arbitrary number the way that the socialists thought. Okay, so the socialists believe that when you earned a profit, that didn't mean anything. That that was just this convention, like it, as if you were playing some kind of card game and then someone earned points, and you could say in the grand scheme it doesn't really mean anything, it's just a bunch of numbers you're writing on a piece of paper. That's what a lot of the, the real naive socialists thought about profits in a market economy. Like to say this particular firm is more profitable than this one over here, and that's why this firm now is gonna gain more market share and is gonna have more dominance and have more influence in the world. To the socialists, that was crazy. That why, should, why should that be the criterion by which we determine who gets to tell us what to do or who gets to determine the use of resources? And so Mises pointed out that what it is in a market economy, earning profits, what that means is, and again, we'll, we'll come back to this as we go on today, that those entrepreneurs were better able to forecast the future and that to earn a profit, just prima facie, what that means is those entrepreneurs use those resources more effectively than other people were. And the socialists, because they're trying to abolish profit and loss and not have market prices, would not have that feedback. So it's, they would, Mises says they'd be groping in the dark not even after the fact, they would have no objective way of evaluating what they did the way that a private business can, you know, after the plan is done, they can look back over the last year, or the last 18 months and say, were we profitable? And that at least gives them some objective metric by which they can say, are we doing the right thing here or are we wasting resources that should be doing something else? Okay, why don't I stop there and I'll turn it back over to Peter. Thanks for your attention.